Hallo und herzlich willkommen bei Weinverstehen leicht gemacht, dem Podcast für alle, die gerne mehr über Wein erfahren möchten. Mein Name ist Florian Bold, ich bin Weinakademiker und ich freue mich sehr, dich heute bei einer neuen Folge meiner Interviewreihe auf ein Glas Wein begrüßen zu dürfen. Ja, heute kommt der dritte und letzte Teil sozusagen meiner Kalifornien. Tour, die am 25. Februar stattfand. Zunächst war ich ja bei der schuk Winery in Sonoma, wo ich Claudia Schuk und Johannes Schneid interviewt habe und dann ging es nachmittags trotz Jetlag noch ins Napa Valley zur Robert Mondavi Winery, wo mich Master of Wine Nova Kadamada empfangen hat. Ja, es ist für mich immer eine relativ große Ehre, ein Master of Wine zu treffen, dann noch persönlich. In aller Regel sind es sehr gefragte und äh, beschäftigte Leute, die natürlich äh, sehr begehrt sind für an Interviews etc. Umso mehr hat es mich gefreut nach fünf Jahren dort mal wieder zu Besuch zu sein. 2013 war ich ja schon mit meinem ehemaligen Kollegen und auch Master of Wein Frank Röder dort und hatte eine Weinverkostung mit Nova gemacht und ähm, daher kannte ich sie von früher schon. Und in den letzten fünf Jahren ist natürlich viel passiert. Sie hat ihr Master of Wein Studium abgeschlossen. Ich bin mittlerweile Weinakademiker. Wir sind beide älter mittlerweile. Und äh, ja, so hat sie es natürlich angeboten, an dem Tag dann trotz der immer zunehmenden Müdigkeit noch das Interview mit Nova zu machen. Das war insofern für mich ziemlich spannend, weil ähm, sie natürlich keine Deutsche ist, wie meine zwei ersten Gesprächspartner. Das wird jetzt auch das erste Interview auf Englisch sein. Und ich war einfach nur gespannt, wie mir das gelingt, das Interview in Englisch dann zu führen, aber ja, verzeiht meinen Slang, aber ich bin eigentlich ganz zufrieden, so wie es gelaufen ist und ich denke, viele in der Hörerschaft können auch hier was mit einem englischen Interview anfangen. Ja, wie lief das ab? Zunächst bin ich dort aufgeschlagen, habe mich bei der beim Empfang angemeldet und das war schon irgendwie das erste lustige Erlebnis, Vorher in dem Familienbetrieb Schug und dann bei einem internationalen Konzern zu sein. Man merkt dann gleich natürlich, dass dort irgendwie ein anderer Wind weht, dass die Abläufe anders sind, dass wahnsinnig viele Leute involviert sind und alles durchgetaktet ist. Während meiner Ankunft kam dann noch ein großer Bus mit Taiwanesen, die wohl auch angemeldet waren für eine andere Veranstaltung. Umso mehr hat es mich aber dann eben auch gefreut, dort äh, begrüßt zu werden und dass sich die Leute dann für mich Zeit genommen hat, haben. Los ging es dann mit einer kleinen Kellerführung von Novas Kollegen Dana, im ganzen Namen äh, Dana Andrus, der dort auch beschäftigt ist seit mehreren Jahren schon und er hat mich mit in den Fasskeller von Mondavi genommen, in, sind in der Zahl äh, drei. Die ganzen Bilder, die ich dort bei Mondavi gemacht habe, werdet ihr dann auch bei Instagram finden. Und wir hatten uns dann zunächst mal intensiv über die äh, Verwendung oder den Einsatz von Holzfässern bei Mondavi unterhalten, die Unterschiede zwischen amerikanischem und französischem Holz und über den Weinmarkt und Trends etc., da hat er sich schon mal äh, sehr Zeit genommen, mir die Sachen zu zeigen und zu erklären. Und besonders spannend fand ich dann auch eben in den Weinkeller zu stehen, wo der, oder sagen nicht der bekannteste, aber einer der bekanntesten Weine, mit dem von David seinerzeit Geschichte geschrieben hat, nämlich der Fumé Blanc, das ist ein Sauvignon Blanc aus dem Holzfass. Das war ja was ganz Neues, was der Mondavi seinerzeit gemacht hat. Ist ein Iconic Wine, sagt man da in Englisch oder auf Amer in Amerika dazu. 
Und äh, ja, da waren wir eben auch in dem Weinkeller, wo dieser Wein eben entsteht. Und ich finde, das hat dann auch immer was, ja, ich möchte jetzt nicht sagen ja, Ergreifendes, das wäre jetzt vielleicht zu viel, aber ja, man merkt halt, man ist in Räumen, wo irgendwie Geschichte geschrieben worden ist, die eine gewisse Bedeutung für den Hersteller oder den Ort haben. Ja, dann kam äh, Nova dazu, wir saßen dann in einem... Verkostungsraum. Leider habe ich vergessen, dann mit Nova das obligatorische Selfie zu machen. Deswegen findet ihr jetzt das alte Bild von meinem ersten Besuch, gemeinsam mit Frank Röder bei Instagram. Und äh, wir hatten dann insgesamt dort äh, fünf Weine probiert und ähm, waren alle sehr lecker, die Weine eigentlich, aber der letzte, der ähm, Signature- Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve, das war natürlich dann schon der Oberknaller und da merkt man einfach auch dann direkt die Qualitätsunterschiede, die ähm, man sich vielleicht sogar nicht vorstellen kann, aber es ist einfach ein wahnsinniger Qualitätsintensitäts- und Komplexitätssprung von der ohnehin schon guten äh, Qualitätsstufe im unteren Preissegment in in Kalifornien oder im Napa Valley heißt unteres Preissegment unter 30 Euro und dann kommt halt diese Granate am Schluss und das ist dann schon nochmal einfach eine ganz andere Welt. Mit Nova habe ich mich dann eben zunächst mal drüber unterhalten, was sie in die Weinwelt gebracht hat, dann ähm, was mich selber persönlich auch sehr interessiert hat, was es für sie bedeutet, Master of Wine zu sein und äh, was für sie der Unterschied zum Weinakademiker ist beziehungsweise wie groß oder umfänglich noch der Aufwand und die Tiefe ist, wenn man die Sachen miteinander vergleicht. Das war dann eine sehr erhellende Antwort für mich persönlich nochmal. Wir sind dann auf Weintrends nochmal eingegangen, auf amerikanische Weine, haben kurz über ihren Arbeitgeber gesprochen, Mondavi beziehungsweise Constellation Brands. Und ähm, ja, insgesamt war das dann ein bisschen mehr als eine Stunde und ich würde sagen, wir fangen dann auch gleich an. Wie immer stellt sich mein Gast zunächst selber vor. Viel Spaß beim Reinhören. Hello, my name is Nova Katamatri, Master of Wine, and I'm the Senior Director of Winemaking at Robert Mondavi Winery. Thank you very much, Nova. Um, so, in the beginning, it's five years ago, uh, we met the first time with uh, Frank Greta, it's a former colleague of mine, a totally colleague already, and he's retired already, and he's also an MW, and I feel very honored to, to have you here in the, in the Holy Halls of uh, Mondavi Winery. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to know what brought you into the wine business. So, um, did you grow up in a no. winery family? Or? No, my family no. has nothing to do with wine, actually. My mom's an artist and my dad's an electrical engineer and I grew up in the southeast and um, really had nothing to do with wine whatsoever. Okay. Um, I met my husband when I was 17, and his family is Italian from New Jersey, and they are very into wine, uh -huh. and so they kind of introduced me to this concept of wine with food and as part of a family gathering, and it was always really fascinating to me to see the different aromas and smells and how it paired with food, and, and I was very much into plants at the time, so okay. I was a horticulture major working on uh, a degree in rose care. Um, and greenhouse production okay. and so it was a very easy switch from talking about the diseases that affect roses which are very easy very similar to the diseases that affect grapevines okay. and so um, I started reading about grapevines and I just got hooked and uh, mm -hmm. haven't book been back <laughs> since <laughs> so It's, I always say it's all my husband's fault. Okay, <laughs> and I think there is really a commodity between roses and wine uh, mm -hmm. because in some vineyards you see the rose bushes is are planted in front of the rose. But yes. uh, I was told it's just for the tourists because if you have the disease in the vineyard, mm -hmm. it's already too late even if the roses show the uh, symptoms. Well, I think we have tools now that are much more advanced than the roses are, but if you think about before we had the growing degree day tracking and, and things like that, that that was the early 
you know, way of telling, uh, oh, do I have mildew in my vineyard? And the, it would always attack the roses before it attacks the grapevines. And so it, it was a good indicator plant, but we have better tools now to get us further ahead yeah. of even when it attacks the the roses because we're able to now understand the weather that these um, funguses thrive yeah. in and, and be able to predict when a bloom will happen. Okay. Um, so we just have better tools now, but you know, it's not saying that roses aren't um, useful, you know, if you don't have access to those so tools, great. Yeah. But, they, and they, but they are beautiful yeah. and I think it's a fun hallmark of history, okay. but we, we just have better tools yeah. now than vineyard. And at the end of the day, does this lead to a less usage of uh, chemicals? I mean, if you yeah. understand the weather better? Yes, then, yeah. the idea is that you're not out every two weeks spraying. You're, you're only spraying when you need to spray, when you know there's a danger of there yeah. being an issue. So yes, it does lead to less chemical use. And from that point uh, of time, you got hooked by wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it must be a long way to become a MW, the Olympus of wine industry, I, I always say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I graduated with my degree from Cornell in 06. I started my WSCT uh, advanced certificate in 07. I started the diploma in 08. Okay. I started the MW in 09 and did my second year of my diploma and my first year of the MW at okay. the same time. Um, and then I sat the MW exam um, six times before I finally really? got both parts. And then oh, that speaks for a good endurance. <laughs> yes, actually. it took yeah. me a total of eight yeah. years in the program to get Okay. Exam. Yeah, I met many people. Uh, they started the MW program, mm -hmm. but uh, only very few people uh, finish mm -hmm. successfully. Yeah. So. Well, there is quite a bit of of resilience. Um, we always say that it has to be the right timing in a person's life and it's okay. not always the right timing. Yeah. Um, you know, and you don't always have to get the credentials to gain something from the program mm -hmm. either. There's a lot you learn just by going through the process. And so I think it's val it's valuable to be involved regardless of what the final outcome is if yeah. you're open to learning what the MWs have to teach. Yeah. Um, but yes, it was it was quite a bit of perseverance, and for me, it was um, I, I wanted to be an MW more than anything, and that, that was I was making that happen. Yeah, so, <laughs> but it, it can only happen with the great support and support of your partner. I yes. guess. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brian was incredibly supportive. My family was incredibly supportive. They didn't always understand it. But they knew what you're doing, or yeah, like they, why you're doing or why it. Why I was yeah. doing it, they, but yeah. they knew it was important. And I also had um, quite a few um, mentors throughout the years that have been very supportive. And um, it, it takes a group, it's not just something that somebody does on right. their own, it really does take a support group. And, um, it, and you need to close contact with your classmates, I would guess. So. You do, but less, yeah. less as you go along because it really is a very solitary. Pursuit, okay. you have support of the people around you, but not necessarily. I mean, you have support of your classmates, absolutely. But you have to understand that because the program pass rate is so small, that you have to be okay with those people that you have been kind of hanging out with and studying with not making it. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's only three of us from my initial class that are MWs now. Yeah. And we've had a class of like 60. Wow. So, so I mean, congratulations by, again. You, yeah. you know, so by the yeah. time by the time you get down to you know like a single part of the exam, like a practical only type situation, yeah, the chances are pretty good that the people you're studying with at that point are going to yeah. make it across. But the people that you start with, it's very likely that they won't be there with you. And you have to kind of just be okay with that and knowing that you're just going to keep going regardless of who's around you. And uh, when I tell people I'm a whole of the wine diploma and uh, they asking me what's above, uh, well, for me it's obviously the master of wine actually. Mm -hmm. And the next question is always... Um, how much more is it? And for me, it's very hard to tell because mm -hmm. from level three to level four, I mean, it was a big step, mm -hmm. but it was, um, what is in English, it was uh, overlookable. Mm -hmm. in, there's a horizon where, where it goes to. Yeah. And uh, 
for me, it's hard to figure out a factor what it what I am done is more than the diploma. So right. it's for factor five. Is it ten? No, is it a hundred? Or it's, what? It's, you can't think of it like that because yeah. it's a, it's a different type of, of learning. Um, so yes, so the, from the advanced to the diploma, yes, it's like a tenfold increase yeah. in knowledge, but. When you get into the um, MW program, and I think our, our my fellow colleague Mark Devere, Master of Wine, explains it the best because he has this pyramid, kind of like the mm-hmm. Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. pyramid, and at the bottom of it is knowledge, and that's what you're getting through the advanced and through the diploma. You're building a database of knowledge in your mind, and the next step up from that is understanding. So it's not necessarily learning more facts; it's understanding why those facts are relevant to mm-hmm. any the relationships given, yes, between, the relationships factors, between yeah. things and the, mm-hmm. you know if something happens in this country in this market how does that affect this you know it's starting to make the connections okay. in the global industry then once you get above the understanding it is um, agility so having the agility of mind to see a question and go okay what in my knowledge bank is applicable to this question mm-hmm. that's asked because a lot of people have a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding but they can't zone in on okay I don't, this is not a question of write everything you know about x yeah. it's what is applicable to this question then the next step above that is clarity and really mm-hmm. clarity comes down to communication can you communicate a concept clearly and succinctly in the time frame set covering yeah. what the question yeah. needs to be covered and the step above that is mastery so once you have okay. achieved all those yeah. steps below it you've, you've reached the point where you can pass okay. the exam and uh, I mean when the the Master of Wine Institute consider itself at the very top of the wine specialists mm-hmm. worldwide yes. so and I know a couple of master of wines all over the world, and um, for me, it's it's hard to take, um, keep it in words or say it with, with the uh, right words. They have something in common, I would say. Mm-hmm. And um, um, what does it personally mean to you? I mean, uh, they they famous in, in the wine world, and uh, how is it to become a MW, and how does it feel for you? And uh, is there an um, elite wise spirit under the successfully masters? Or, um... Well, um, I think globally it, it's different for every MW, like how it feels. Yeah. Um, I think it depends on the country you're in. The, in the US, the MWs aren't as well recognized as, say, the Master Psalms are. Um, so it, it's a little bit different. Like, I've had a number of people um, confuse me with the Master Psalms. So it's like yeah. the difference isn't yeah, quite yeah. clearly understood. Um, but the um, feeling of what it, it's just in some ways it's a relief to have gotten there um, <laughs> the, you know in other ways it's it's kind of the beginning of a journey that you thought was the end of a journey but it really is just another chapter in your life yeah. um, and for me it's a really it allows me to walk into a room and have an instant level of credibility where when I started the program, I didn't have that. Yeah. And, and being a woman in the industry and being young, um, considerably younger yeah. than many of my peers, it was very difficult to be taken seriously. Okay. And ultimately, that's why I started the program. Is, is okay. like, I want to be able for people to, to listen to what I have to and say. And is it in some kind of gender thing, you would say? Or is it... um, I don't know if it was a gender thing or just how young I, I okay. was. Um, I mean, I'm still relatively young, but at the time I was yeah. really young. And um, it, I, th- I think it, the combination of both of those things was, was challenging. And so um, that's, that's ultimately why I started the program, okay. is just to be taken more yeah. seriously. But I, I like it very much what you're saying, because whenever I met an MW or listening to a podium discussion where MW was um, involved, what, what me fascinated was always the... Um, style of answers they gave to a specific question and that exactly what what you mentioned it's it's the ability to uh, explain complex uh, relations in understandable and easy words mm-hmm. and uh, for me it's mostly it's a very eye opening uh, when you when i have the chance to ask a specific thing on a on a fair or so 
and uh, what's the answer of an Australian MW mm -hmm. or a US or a German one and um, yeah it's I think it's, it's really great to have the opportunity to talk to MW actually yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, you told me before you went for a couple of years to the Finger Lakes yes. and they're running your own winery. Yes. What, was that a, a well, dream of you? Or yes, yeah. so ultimately that's why I'm That's a water glass, by the way. Oh, uh, we can. Or which one is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so ultimately, you know, the idea my husband had way back when was <laughs> the quote was. Um, we should start a vineyard. My family in Italy did it. It can't be that hard. Yeah. That was the quote. And so I said, well, let me, let me look into it. Let me see how hard this really would be. And, you know, it turns out it's really very difficult to start your own vineyard. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of knowledge and things like that. And so as we were going through our careers, we were constantly trying to pick up tidbits of information and, and understanding of the, of the eventual goal was that we would have our own place. And, um, and so we moved back to the Finger Lakes in part to do that. The other part was um, uh, I got a job offer with Constellation to move back mm -hmm. and uh, be part of a very exciting project to um, kind of revamp a winery that we have back there and also to start a, a Finger Lakes brand for Constellation. Okay. And so we, I started the, two, the brand 240 Days for Constellation out there. It's a very small brand, but yeah. it's really nice high-end Finger Lakes wine. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I did all, all of those things together. Um, so we still have, we don't have a vineyard, but we still have our own small brand. Yeah. And from the uh, European perspective, I would say the Finger Lakes are a hidden gem. I mean, yes. it's, it's almost unknown mm -hmm. in, in Europe or Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they doing great white mm -hmm. wines yep. over there. So uh, which varieties have you grown? Um, so for Constellation, I worked on Riesling, and we did a, a beautiful dry rosé, um, we did Cabernet Franc, and okay. uh, most recently Blau Frankish. And the Blau Frankish isn't released yet, that'll come out this okay. summer. So it's a kind of cool climate. You very say, cool yeah. climate, exactly. Mm -hmm. very, you know, it's a short growing season, um, lots of humidity, you know, it's a very challenging area to mm -hmm. grow grapes. You know, the joke is that you'll see everything that could go wrong in a single vintage <laughs> out there versus other regions of the world. So. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a unique area, but it's really beautiful. And the recent style is comparable with Germany or it has its, its own style? I, I would consider, if I was comparing it to Germany, I would consider it more false style than Mosul. Um, mm -hmm. But I think Austria has the most in common with the style. Really? So if you were to combine the dry Rieslings of Austria with the the Trocken styles of false and kind of put them together, that's okay. kind of finger lakes. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so, Mondami, I think as, as we met the first time, you were here at Mondami yes. already? Yes, I was the red wine maker. And um, what brought you to Mondami especially? Was this it? was always my dream job. Um, so when I came out to California with Constellation in 2006, I met Jean-Bierre Jensen's um, in 07, I think it was. And I just love the wines. I love the story. I love the history here. And um, I, I went up to her in a tasting. I was like, if you ever need like an analogist or something, they just call me because I'd yeah. love to be here. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of funny, but she remembered that, well, which was really <laughs> interesting. And um, so fast forward several years later, and in 2012, their red winemaker left. And um, I was up in Alexander Valley. And I saw the job come open, and actually the job was posted the first day of my third attempt at the Master of Wine exam. Okay. And I, um, so my husband texted me, he said, the job you always wanted just came open. And I was like, why would you send me that right now? <laughs> it's just getting ready to like calm my nerves to yeah. be in a good spot. Um, and so, and I was also five months pregnant with my son. And so there was a lot going on in my life at the time. And so I went back and forth and going, oh, well, do I apply? Do I not apply? And there's no way they would hire me. Why would, why would they ever bother to hire me? And, um, you know, and so then I, my husband just said, look, you should just do it, just apply. And then if, they, the if they say no, yeah. they say no, but at least you did it and yeah. you don't wonder. And so I did. And then, um, so it was like, two months before I ever even got a call for an interview because I and I by the time I got the call I'd forgotten about it okay um and because you, you gave it not a chance I mean you, you well, did not expect to I be, didn't well after yeah. two months you're yeah. like yeah they yeah. just they, they didn't yeah, yeah. yeah so 
Um, so it's funny because they, they called me and they said, okay, come in for an interview. So I went in for the first interview and I was like, okay, well, that'll probably be it. And then they called me again for another interview. And I went through like five different rounds of interviews. And by the time I got to the last one, I was like, I think they're seriously considering me for this. <laughs> and so then I got here. Um, and I mean, how, how long were the interviews? I mean, if you, uh, if you took was, five interviews, that it was a long process. Say, yeah. It was a long process, yeah. and it's funny because I'm on the other side of it now because we're hiring another winemaker here, and uh -huh. it, it takes a while to go through all the applicants because there are so many talented winemakers out there. And um, what are the criteria? I mean, there are obvious ones, mm -hmm. but uh, um, do you looking for people? Um, they really into Mondavi, they know the styles, or is it more from the production side? They... I mean, for me, it's uh, the baseline is okay, I have to have made wine sure, yeah. in, at, at a level that would be equivalent yeah. to Mondavi. But really, it's at that point, you're looking for fit, you're looking for you know somebody who can be embracing of the culture, but also bring something new to the table, but not be so revering of the history that they don't want to change anything, but not be so avant-garde that they want to change everything. You know, so it's, it's, a, fine, it's a fine line uh, to who's going to, to, to fit in. And, and I want to bring somebody in that can um, contribute to the future of the winery as well. You know? yeah. So that, that's what I'm looking for. Um, and I hope that's what they were looking for when they hired me. <laughs> <laughs> it must be since we were something somewhere else actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Constellation Brands mm -hmm. have something to do with Mondami yes. for our listeners. So, yes, they, uh, yeah. we, are, we are owned by Constellation Brands. So um, since when? I mean, 2004 was four, the okay. sale. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I started working for Constellation in 2005 as an intern, and I've worked my way up through um, the company. Okay. Um, and I, it's a great company to work for. And the, the beautiful thing about it is, is they really do value the art side of this level of winemaking. Okay. And, and so it, it's important to you know, take all perspectives, including a financial perspective, but it, it is also important to really keep quality at the forefront. And that's something they really allow us to do, which is very nice. Okay, so that means they let you alone what you and uh, you can do what you think is right for yes. for producing wine at that level, which meaning it, or wine is considered considered like a kind of art mm -hmm. in that quality level, yes. and um, they value it. Yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And um, Constellation Brands, I mean, it's a very big company. Mm -hmm. It's a worldwide player. Yes, and we're getting bigger uh, every year. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it already the biggest uh, producer of uh, drinks and all kinds of stuff? We are the, the largest um, total beverage alcohol company in the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we have the beer, spirits, and wine. And the market share in, in Europe, is it? Uh, I do not know. Yeah. I don't know. I have actually other brands are very well known in, in Europe. I think Robert Mondavi is for, for sure. sure. Yeah, I've done, I've done besides, quite a bit of yeah. market work in Europe for Mondavi. Um, I think our brand Ravenswood is pretty well known over there. I know Joel Peterson did a lot of work in Europe um, for that. Yeah, I think it depends on the brand. Okay. Yeah. And uh, well, we are here in the uh, Napo Valley. Mm -hmm. um, that's also a very famous name, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, there is almost nobody. Well, who haven't heard about Napa Valley? Right. I mean, it's one of the big brands in the wine world. Um, what makes Napa so special from your point of view? From my point of view, I think what makes Napa special is it's in this real little microcosm of a beautiful weather pattern and then sitting on some of the most unique soils in the world, and the combination of those two really makes it a great place to grow grapes. So you think about having the cooling influence from the fog, uh, but we don't get quite as much fog as, say, Sonoma County mm -hmm. does, so it's a little bit warmer, so we're able to you know, make these beautiful, finely textured, juicy Cabernets, and, um, but we still have really amazing volcanic-based soils because the Vaca Mountains were all volcanic uh, mountains and so that whole side of the valley is very crunchy, rocky, mm -hmm. volcanic stuff. And on this side of the mountain, it's more um, calcareous. Um, this is my um It's more calcareous and um, fluvial <laughs> deposits coming down onto the fans for Oakville and Rutherford. And and so it's it's a really unique site because you have 
multiple types of soils in one very small area. And uh, so that's um, let's say we have one area in Germany where it's could be similar, maybe not soil wise, mm -hmm. but uh, the Nahe Valley mm -hmm. is. I think that that's a place where very different types of soils on a very little square meter. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, and that makes it possible to produce very um, different wine styles right. in, in Riesling in that case. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the terroir or the climate could not be the only points which make Napa so special. I mean, mm -hmm. even price-wise, is mm -hmm. Napa one of the um, well, uh, most expensive areas mm -hmm. in the world? So, yeah, uh, well, I think it helps that it's beautiful. So it's very photogenic. I think, you know, that helps have the mystique of the, of the valley. There's also, you know, back in the, the 70s, and the 60s and the 70s, when Mr. Mondavi was starting this winery and getting it going, and there were so many families in this valley that all came together and said, we are going to make this a success. And I don't know um, if, without that, if it would be as well known as it is today, because it was kind of like a rising tide raises yeah. all the ships, and everybody was knowing that if one person won, they all won. And that's a really great feel to have. And to me, that's what's going on in the Finger Lakes right now, is yeah. that, that same camaraderie. But I think without that, they, you probably wouldn't know Napa as well as, as we do now. But a lot of it comes down to the soil and the climate and the being able to produce great fruit. And where there is great fruit, you then attract great talent to make great wines from that fruit, and then you've got this whole community of people going, this is an amazing spot. Yeah. So I think it's everything together. Okay, and um, how big was the influence from the Silicon Valley? I mean, I have in mind, as my first time I learned about Napa Valley, I was told uh, that big business from the Silicon Valley and the huge amount of money make people uh, able to buy or build up a new winery mm -hmm. and uh, they took it as art or as a hobby, mm -hmm. a very expensive hobby and uh, they put the quality to a next level mm -hmm. as, um, well, it's a lifestyle project I would mm -hmm. say. So. Um, um, well, I definitely could, think could that happen without the Silicon Valley? That's a question. I'm you know, having. I definitely think it's helped because you've got a large uh, population of people with, um, and at the time, especially during the dot com era, you know, there was a lot of major money yeah. floating around and people <laughs> looking for other investments, and proximity had to have played a role here. Um, and I think that definitely ushered in the era of the um, the cold wines for sure. Yeah. Uh, but outside of that, you know, would Napa have happened without um, the Silicon Valley? I, I think so because it did. Yeah. You know, I think Silicon Valley probably didn't become a major player in Napa until the '90s, and it was well on its way to being a world class okay. wine region before that. So it was more or less a catalysator for for speeding up yes. the trend. Which I which agree. already exists. Yeah. And um, was well, not well educated wine drinker, if that's a politically correct as <laughs> for, um, makes, well, for sure it makes sense, but uh, how would you explain the differences from one village to, to the other? I mean, we, we're talking about Napa Valley, mm -hmm. but Napa Valley uh, containing a lot of uh, villages and they are have different styles. I mean, mm -hmm. and, um, to be honest, I think makes it sense to talk about the Napa Valley as itself, or is it more uh, wise to discuss from one village to the other because there is a difference in the styles? I think you can do both. Um, for for us, especially for our Napa Valley tier, which we'll taste in a little bit, um, the the Napa Valley has its own feeling together. Like if you take all of the aspects of Napa and put it in one blend, like we do with our Napa Valley Cab, um, you see what the valley is on mm -hmm. its own. I think once you start diving into the different districts, like Stagsley District or Oakville or Carneros or Rutherford or whatever, um, then you start to see the minute differences. Mm. But I don't know. I mean, they are they are strong differences. But unless you are very well versed, I think in Napa Valley terroir, it, it may not be immediately obvious, like you said, to, to people who are just getting to know the Napa yeah. Valley. Um, so I, I definitely recommend starting with. 
wines that cover <laughs> the whole valley. Uh -huh. And then once you become very comfortable with what the valley itself has, then diving into the, the different uh, nuances between okay. the different districts. And uh, before we taste the first wine, uh, that brings me to the question about the philosophy behind the winemaking, because we're talking about the climate and the terroir mm -hmm. and the uh, different villages. That gives me the taste that your philosophy or the uh, Mondavis philosophy could be the wine is made in the vineyard mm -hmm. and not in the cellar. I mean, that's mm -hmm. big discussion between Burgundy and yeah. Bordeaux. Uh, or is it, uh, is it better to uh, take best from both worlds? Or to me, it's yeah. both. It yeah. really is both because you, I've seen so often fruit from the same vineyard go to different winemakers and you end up with radically different styles of wine because of picking decisions or um, yeast choices or whether to use yeast or not or and combo regimes and oak all, you know, options. Yeah. There's so many different aspects that the winemaking teams are influencing that it, it's it's difficult for it not to be both. You know, the vineyard gives you your initial quality and then it's up to the team to preserve that quality or enhance it. Yeah. Um, and I think if you look at the French feeling of te the meaning of terroir is that it, the, it encompass, encompasses the people um, mm, sure. that I are part of the vineyard and that are part of the winemaking process. And, and I, I do believe that that is part, an essential part of what terroir is. But for us, yeah, I mean, I want to take what comes out of the vineyard and translate it into the best wine we possibly can and hopefully you don't know we were ever there. <laughs> you know, that, that's the goal, yeah. right? You know, yeah. that's, that's the, the idea is to make no, that, a really beautiful wine. Uh, so is it fair to say that's a theoretical discussion to differentiate the uh, philosophy that the wine is made in the vineyard or in the wine uh, cellar? I mean, I don't know that's it. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's both. Yeah. And that's my personal philosophy. Is I had my one of my first winemaking mentors back in the Finger Lakes um, that I worked with was both the vineyard manager and the winemaker. And he said, I start thinking about the wine I want to make when I go out and prune that vintage. You know, and so he's constantly thinking of, okay, this is the pruning, and then this is the mm -hmm. next thing, and this is the, it's just another part of the winemaking yeah. process. And it's the vineyard. But he's helping shape the wine in the vineyard, and and then you have the weather aspects and things you can't control, and that's what gives you the different vintage aspects. And that's why this is an art form; is it's a performance yeah. art. You know, you can't ever do it the same way. Even if you do it the same way, it's never yeah. the same way that you did it the previous years. But well, sometimes I think that's only a vehicle to uh, full or to say that we trust different than someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are very special because we do it like that way, you know, mm -hmm. and. This one is more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, well, that's different, and that's our uh, unique selling point. Mm -hmm. Let's say marketing language. But well, I think you know. I think it's it's difficult to say you know we're better because we do it this other yeah. way and somebody else does it a different way. I, I think that's what's gorgeous about wine and the wine industry is you can have so many different translations of fruit yeah. coming off of vineyards, and you know it's not to say that one's better than another. And every year you improve and you want to improve and, and that's our goal here is to keep getting better and better and better and so that's not to say what we've done in the past is Absolutely. is is wrong but yeah. it's you know you have to keep moving and um, and I would hate to ever say that somebody down the road was doing something yeah, yeah. wrong they're just right. doing something different yeah. than, than what we're doing and that in itself is something cool about Absolutely. the industry and it starts Uh, over again and again with, with, with uh, each vintage. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Every year is different. I would say that's a good time for having the first wine, okay. if you agree. Yes, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Let's head. So this is our 2017 um, Napa Valley Fumé Blanc. And as you know, Mooster Mondavi coined the term Fumé Blanc back in the 1960s when most of the Sauvignon Blanc on the market was sweet. And he really wanted to make a point of differentiation that this is a dry Sauvignon Blanc, even okay. to the point where it's still on the label it says a dry Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and so it is primarily Sauvignon Blanc, and there's a little bit of Simeon as well, so very similar to style you might find in a, a dry white Bordeaux. Um, 
and then this very um, neutral oak and a little bit of stainless steel put in. And I think the biggest misconception with Fumé Blanc these days is that it has to be oaked and overtly oaky, and that was not the idea. Okay. The reason he never trademarked it is he really wanted other people to to embrace this style um, so that we could see how good Seven Watt could be in California. And I think it's now become a very iconic style for the state. So, I mean, you can see it's got really beautiful nose, mm -hmm. you know, fresh grass and, and passion oh, yeah. fruit and mm -hmm. grapefruit. And uh, I mean, the my name, Fumé Blanc, mm -hmm. I think there, there's the French wine Blanc Fumé. Exactly. Uh, so, just, yeah. yeah. Um, was it easy for the customers to understand it? That I mean, those two wines are, are considerably different. They are, yeah. um, and particularly that's you know we're talking Loire versus Bordeaux, and then sort of stylistically, it's quite different. Um, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't obviously I wasn't around in the '60s, <laughs> um, so I can't really speak for that. But I would imagine that um, anything new is sometimes confusing to the customer, but. One thing Mr. Mondavi was really fabulous at was selling and explaining and talking about this is the story, this is the story of this wine. And I know he beat the pavement and he had his sales force beat the pavement. And, and I believe if there was any confusion about what this wine was, he quickly dispelled it in whatever market he was in. Um, and I think that's why it's so iconic now. And the uh, part of Semillon is um, responsible for the uh, body of the wine. Mm. Or, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it is on leaf mm -hmm. for uh, four months with stirring and things like that. So that adds some body, but you get the oiliness on the back palate yeah. and a little bit of a savory note from the Semillon. Yeah, and then it's just got that great freshness of being yeah, it's the just mouth, very yeah, very mouth watering. Absolutely, I, I mean it's a kind of fresh acidity which makes it crisp and even it's not a, a super slim wine, mm -hmm. I would say that makes it good for a um, warm summer day mm -hmm. on the Peshu. Yeah. Well, I, I have it in my uh, wine classes. Uh, very often mm -hmm. because it's so special and it's an iconic wine, I would mm -hmm. say, which is a good example um, that wine inventions are made mostly abroad of Europe. I mean, uh, they concentrating always on traditions, and um, yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I think, and there's a payback for, for the old world as well, mm -hmm. seeing what's going on in Australia with the uh, super modern cellar yeah. technique and so on, and, um, mm -hmm. and it takes back. The other really amazing thing about Fumé Blanc is even the Napa Valley tier ages very, very well. It's got that freshness, and you know, so I would say, I mean, five to six years is not unheard of for still being in a really nice drinking window. And then when you get to the Oakville and the Reserve, those can age even longer. So one of the things I've noticed in Europe is when I've gone over there, they're normally a vintage or two behind, but the wines are so gorgeous yeah. at that point. Like I almost feel like right after they're released, they're a little too young. And so you guys have like the perfect aging point by the time yeah. it makes it to y'all, so. Yeah, I had a, a 2007 Fumé Blanc last year, so it was uh, almost 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say it was just at the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have no clue how long it takes until it uh, ends over, mm -hmm. but 10 years is, I mean, that's a long for a white wine. It is, yeah, it, it is absolutely. Yeah. So Should we drink it in your spare time as well? I, mean, I of course drink yeah. it in my spare time. How much alcohol has it actually? Um, usually this is right around 13%. This one's 14.5, but we try to keep it between 13.5 and 14.5. And the well, um, alcohol content above the average comes from the Semillon as well because it's... Uh, yeah, the yeah. Semillon does come in a little bit riper, but we start picking the, the Fumé at 21 bricks, you know, so we start... Which is in Rexler? Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Where's the calculator? Yeah, I'm going to have to look back up. I'm just looking up afterwards. <laughs> Well, it would basically be the equivalent of, you know, below the Ushla that a typical Cabinet would be. Yeah. You know, so it, it's, you know, you, you 
would typically see it around that general zone, um, but bone dry. So you have the higher alcohol, you're not having like the eight or nine percent okay. alcohol. It'd be like you know thirteen. 14. Yeah, so. And BRIX is the common uh, unit for the sugar content. Yes, in the yes. US. So it's really a measure of density, but you know, it, it also is, you know, zero BRIX is like the density of water. water so yeah. the more sugar you have, the higher the BRIX. Yeah, and then yeah. once, once you go dry, you actually go into negative BRIX territory. I think that's the same system. It's a KMV, but it's a little similar. Bit different. Uh, or, yeah, it's similar. So this is our uh, Carne or Napa Valley Shard. So the color is uh, considerably yes, so it's uh, darker. Much more golden. Golden, yeah. Yeah. That was more like um, yeah. This the in yeah. German. The fume yeah. is that very bright, fresh green, almost greeny tinge around mm -hmm. the, and very clear um, rim. And then this is a much more golden hue. I mean, it's very typical of Chardonnay. You know, you, you, Chardonnay typically has a very much more deeper color, very ripe uh, fruit profile, very you know, yellow apple and golden color. And the color is um, a little bit darker because of the uh, usage of the birds as well, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, but Chardonnay, though, on its own, even if it was an oat, does have a darker inherent color than Sauvignon Blanc does. Mm. And this is the 15 vintage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm. this wine um, has about 20% yeah. new oak, but mm -hmm. spends about nine months in the oak with leaves staring and it's just got that beautiful mouth feel. The other thing that's very cool about this wine is we inoculate every lot for malolactic, but we stop every lot right mm -hmm. at the point where it's perfectly balanced. Okay. And so that when it comes to blending, then you blend it all together and you've got this bright, beautiful freshness, but you still have that roundness from some of the mallow. But never the butter over butter character. It's just beautiful, structured wine and not super oaky. You know, so there's there's the super butter oak uh, profile, but that is not mm. who, who we are. Well, I, I totally love this style of Chardonnay. It's, and I, I think that the almost perfect example that, uh, um, well, huge is the wrong word, but um, considerably tasteable oak flavors could be balanced very nicely with uh, fruit. Mm -hmm. and. The, uh, the wine must bring some structure and Stoffigkeit, yeah, that's difficult <laughs> in, in English. Um, the wine must must be able to hold the, the usage of, yes. of barrels. So yes. uh, the there must be some fruit, the fruit yeah. weight. Yeah, like, to me, we, we always talk about fruit weight. And you don't ever want to over oak a wine over -oak, if, yeah. it's a, if it's a leaner style. Um, but that's the beauty of these wines is you have that fruit weight to hold up with the, the oak and you just get that warmth and the baking spices and you know, beautiful brioche. toastiness and brioche and, and but then they still got that bright primary fruit there as well right in the core of the yeah. wine. It tastes very young I would say I mean mm -hmm. uh, and it's already three three years old um, what what is the perfect bottle age? Of that wine. Ooh, perfect bottle age. It depends. It always depends. It depends on what type of drinker you are, because people ask me that all the time, and yeah. I know that some people prefer more age, more hazelnut, and and characteristics like that. Some people prefer the more fruit forward. So it really depends on what type of drinker you you are. Yeah. So if you're more fruit forward drinker, obviously I'm going to say drink it younger. If you want more of that hazelnut brioche biscuit notes mm. that comes with an aged Chardonnay, I, I would say you need to start drinking this at like eight or nine years old. Okay. Well, and uh, I, I uh, read about a very interesting statistic for the German wine market and it says um, it was about 95% of each wine bottle is consumed three days after the day of, yes. of uh, um, Buying. Yes. So, and that tells you a lot how the market in Germany is and uh, what the customer is used to be uh, considering what is a good wine. Right. And they, they do not know that uh, how uh, uh, aged wine tastes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would uh, scare, I would be scared to, to serve someone a 10 years old white wine because maybe he does not. Appreciate, appreciate it, really, yeah. yeah, and, and that's, uh, 
the same problem, in, I mean, whether it's a problem or not, I don't know. I think it's great that people are drinking wine regardless. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the same thing exists in the U.S. And I think I've seen the same study where in the U.S. 95% of the wine is consumed within 24 hours of picking the wine up. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If people like young, fresh, fruity styles, I don't want to say you're doing it wrong because you're drinking it, you're enjoying it, you're, that's the point. I yeah. want people to enjoy the wines. Um, but I do agree with what you're saying. Like, if you were to pull out an older bottle of wine, would people appreciate it? And I believe that people who are very into wine, regardless of how much they know or not, will always recognize quality, regardless of how mm -hmm. old the wine is. Correct. And um, particularly if it's a wine that's aged quite well. So I don't know that I would be afraid of that. I, t I think you need to judge your audience and understand that is this a person that really loves great wine and if they are then why not pull out an older bottle and say this is the bottle i've been saving and this is one i we did that the other night um i had a friend over this weekend we pulled out an 04 um and i remember when i bought it because we had just gotten out of school yeah. it was the first year we were out and had actually been able to afford buying nice wines yeah. to age and i remember picking that up and going i never would have believed that where i was when i bought this bottle was and to now i would have come that far but here I am with friends, and I'm going to share it with people that are really going to appreciate it. Mm. I think I think that's really what it's all about. I, I I would assume that there are more people out there liking aged wines if they have ever tried it. That's mm -hmm. my point. Yeah, and, uh, I agree. They, they need to have the opportunity mm -hmm. to taste it somewhere mm -hmm. to to let them know what kind of wines are available mm -hmm. and. Uh, that means you need to buy, I mean, is that 2015, that's the actual uh, vintage yes. on sale? Mm -hmm. Though that means you need to buy it in, in a year and uh, drink it 10 years later, and I mean, that's a kind of investment. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know that you need to, though. I think that's the point. I yeah. it, yes, you can, but I don't know that you need to. Um, but... I, I always like people to buy, I mean, obviously, I like people to buy a case so you can try, you know, pick up a right. bottle a year or two bottles a year and, you know, then you have a six-year span or a 12-year span to understand how the wine changes over time. But, you know, you think about the way that a lot of people live these days. We, many people don't have cellars. They don't have uh, places to store the wine. They yeah. don't have the financials to have giant Euro caves in their house. Yeah. Like, that's just not reality that we live in. Um, so I think... You know, I want people to enjoy the wine however they feel most comfortable enjoying it. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, if, if, if you hear wine freaks talking about or, or talking together about a, a very old wine or a very expensive wine, I mean, that keeps people in distance to wine because yeah. they think it's very elitary exclusive, yes. and exclusive mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, yeah. but on the other hand I mean that's a point you made before with the Master Wine Institute and that is true for the WST as well I mean we are all um, in charge of educating people mm -hmm. about wine I mean that's what makes fun to me to to, mm -hmm. let, to increase the knowledge about wine uh, to other people yeah. and um, yeah aged wines um, are quite seldom, and uh, I enforce people. No, I enforce, not encourage people to drink more aged wines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, for me, you know, you think about wine as compared to any other product you might get at the grocery store to go with your meal. Like, say you go and you buy jam, yeah, and you pit, you take the jam home, you open it up, you try it, and you're like, I don't know if I really like this jam. The difference between wine wine people and um, jam people basically is the jam people go I don't like this jam I'm not going to buy it again the wine people go I don't like this wine there must be something wrong with me they don't assume it's the jam uh -huh. they just assume it's them uh -huh. it's something inherently wrong with them that they don't appreciate it or something wrong you know and um, I think that's gone on with wine far too long that people assume it's something internal to them that they don't like and so I try to tell people like, you just may have not tried what you like yet that doesn't mean you don't like all you know, wines. Sure. Yeah, it just yeah. maybe you haven't found the right one for you yeah, yet. Correct. Um, but I, I hate to see that when people say, "Oh, I just don't <laughs> like this. It must be something wrong with me. I just uh, may not like wine." And it's like, no, it, you know, maybe it's not that type of wine you, for you. You would say that's um, 
um, in the US correct? Or is it even correct for, for, for Germans? I mean, is it, is I it a cultural say, thing? I would say it's a cultural thing everywhere, really. Okay. Because even in you know in Asia, you see that like, there's there's this mystique around mm. wine, and in some cases, you know, I agree with it because there are some really beautiful, like extraordinarily rare types of wine out there that are you know unattainable for most people. So there is that, but the vast majority of wine, like you said, is meant to be enjoyed by you know, the normal person yeah. on a special occasion or something like that, mm -hmm. particularly our wines. I realize our wines are not an everyday drinking okay. wine, but they are for special occasions and yeah. you know, are approachable to the normal consumer. Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't want them to feel that a bad experience with one wine turns them off to yeah. all wines. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always often asked what is my favorite wine, and I, I would say... That's a hard question to be answered because yes. it depends on so much on the season, on my daily mood, on mm -hmm. the location, on my food, yes. what, how the weather is, I'm and, the same and so way. on. Yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. People go, what are your favorite wines? Well, I'm like, I don't know. What's the weather outside? What am I eating? Who am I with? You know? um, it, it's, I'm the, exactly the same way. And by the way, since wines are available in Germany as well? Yes, yeah. most of them are. Um, this is our, our standard... Um, Line and this is the most widely distributed okay. uh, of them. I'm not sure about that. Oh, the Pinot may not may not be, but yeah. you know, we'll we'll taste it anyway. Okay. So it is part of the lineup. Um, so this is the 2015 Carneros Pinot, mm -hmm. and this is part of the Napa Valley line. But because Carneros is so cool, and it really is the only place in Napa that is cool enough for Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. it says Carneros on it. So there's no confusion that we're growing Pinot up here in Oakville. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's <been> interesting. <laughs> But the, I mean, the idea with this wine is to really just have it be a very classically styled Pinot Noir. Beautiful nose, mm -hmm. elegant perfume, floral notes, light spice from the oak. Just delicate yeah, and typical, beautiful. Um, typical cherry. Mm -hmm. Black uh, Schatten Morelle. Is that a, yeah. mm -hmm. That's the very black carrot cherry. Yeah. Um, fly uh, cherry. We just call it yeah. fly cherry. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's very... Gorgeous cherry here. Mm -hmm. A bit spicy as well. Mm -hmm. And again, you want the freshness on the palate because to me, Pinot is all about freshness. You need that, that energy. Um, you don't want it to be flabby or you know too weighty. Uh -huh. You've got that great texture, silky tannin. That's interesting because, in my opinion. Pinot Noir is not the easiest understandable um, uh, variable <laughs> and um, because they are not the boldest red wines for sure and mm -hmm. um, as I started with wine um, I was not really a Pinot Noir lover or mm -hmm. Spielburgunder mm -hmm. and um, the more I learned about wine the more I loved yeah, uh, Pinot Noir. <clears throat> Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, Unfortunately, think, my wife doesn't. So, oh, I, oh, no. <laughs> but well, I think if you think of, of different types of wine, like it's different personalities, somewhat is like you know, Cabernet may be like your big burly linebacker, but Pinot Noir is kind of like your more elegant dancer, and both both have a a power to them. But it's a different type of power, you know. Whereas Pinot, the power lies in the elegance and the subtlety. Um, so that's my. This wine remembers me from some Pinot Noirs I have um, tried in uh, Alto Adice. Mm -hmm. Does that make that sense to you? It or makes sense it, yeah. to me, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I love Alto Adice. Alto Adice. Mm. South Tyrolia. Is that in English correct? Mm -hmm. South, South Tyrolia? Or how do you say to Alto Adice? Uh, Südtirol. Südtirol, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Lovely. Yeah. And the aging potential is, is at least 10 years, right? I would yeah. say so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And again, following that same guideline that if you want more cherry fruit, you know, you drink it earlier. If you want more soubois, forest floor, earthy notes, you drink it later. And, and if you want some combination, you pick it in the middle somewhere. That's, that's, what, that's normally where I fall. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of in the middle drinker. My husband's more of an aged wine drinker. So we tend to open things middle to later in their lives. And the alcohol content is about... Uh, this one should be about 14.5. Yep, 14.5. 14.5, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's uh, on the higher side, I would for, say. For, for Pinot, Pino, yeah. For Pino, yes. But you, you have to remember, we have a lot of sunshine here, and that's really the key, is that, that bright sunshine uh, brings a lot of sugar with it. Um, sure. And so what we do as we watch the Pinot ripen is we watch the acid more than the sugar. So we know the sugar is going to get there. Yeah. We want to make sure we don't lose the freshness yeah. of the acid. So that's what we're looking for. And that's, that is done with uh, canopy management? Or? Well, it's, it's canopy management. It's analysis. So okay. Just watching the acid yeah. the fruit. So maybe that's the similarity with the uh, Sutiol Pinot mm -hmm. Noir because they have much more sun than High uh, we altitude, have. High yeah, lots yeah. of sun, yes, absolutely. I, and I think that that is definitely the case. Very bright, pure sunlight. Mm -hmm. yep. hmm. And what is the price uh, <coughs> for that bottle? For the Pinot Noir? Yeah. I think it's 30. 30. <laughs> Can you drop a word about the price point of a wine? I mean, uh, what what makes the or what what goes into the yeah, pricing correct, of a bottle yeah. wine? I can speak in generalities yeah. because I mean every wine is different. But generally speaking, about half of the price of a bottle of wine is the fruit that actually goes into okay. it. Okay. Um, if it's a red wine, usually you have like another quarter that's the oak. Because oak is quite expensive, mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of it is all your other miscellaneous things like your yeast and your debris, or your winemaker salary, your overhead, your packaging materials, or, mm -hmm. you know things like that. Um, so, but you're the, by far and away the biggest driving cost of a bottle of wine is the cost of the fruit that's going into that bottle. And um, then the cost of the fruit is considerably influenced by the uh, value of the, um, of the land. plot where mm -hmm. it grows. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, what is the share of the brand? <laughs> what of is the, the, the brand of the name? I mean the, the brand or the, the... It depends. It really, I mean it depends on the brand. It depends on, I mean, there's so much. Like, so that's, that's why I'm saying yeah. there's a lot. Generally speaking, I can say that, but a lot goes into it that's not that's, you know, brand related yeah. or history related. You know, and, and so it's different for every wine. Um, and every company costs their wine slightly differently. So, But generally speaking, you know, most, yeah. the most expensive thing you're buying is the fruit. Okay. And is Napa Valley a place where the brand plays a bigger role for the price finding than somewhere else? Or is it... When you're... When you're buying... I, I think about Opus One or Screaming or something. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I don't know if it plays a bigger role, because look at DRC, you know, mm. that's, yeah. it's very similar. The man, how many county yeah. power listeners? Yes, yeah. you know, that's, <laughs> you know, there are, are wineries in every region of the world that have done an amazing job of building their brands and are, are able to charge for that. I don't think it's a Napa-centric thing yeah. at all. Um, Okay. So this is the 2016 Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. So mm -hmm. coming back to, you know, what Napa Valley is known for, what it, you know, has made mid most famous by is, is Cabernet. And just like Bordeaux, this is a, um, a wine that has all five Bordeaux varieties in it, um, but primarily it's Cabernet. That reminds me a little bit of... Um Christmas bakery, mm -hmm. so um, there is the, the, the little cubes covered with chocolate and the uh, Lebkuchen inside. Mm. Uh, Domino Stein, we call it. Mm -hmm. Domino, no, okay. no, 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 no. Yeah, so it's that's a spicy, mm -hmm. sweet, mm -hmm. and the taste of chocolate. So yes. uh, that that's yeah. everything yeah. that Cabernet <laughs> is absolutely, and it's got that great dark cassis, yeah, cassis blackberry cassis. characters. And, you know, really intensely spicy, brown spices, warm spices, and I think your your that reference, right, your reference right. to Christmas is absolutely yeah. spot on because I mean to me that's that's when these wines I drink the most Cabernet <laughs> yeah. on the um, not only because it's cold but because I think yeah. it it goes well with that time of year it like feels really yeah. good but definitely you can enjoy it at other times as well. Yeah, that's also a mistake in the wine industry or uh, for the customer. 
in Germany they drink white wine in the summer and red wine in the winter. Mm -hmm. But if they go to Italy for holiday in August, where it's hot as hell, mm -hmm. they drink drinking red, red wine. wine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you know, I think again, it's it's so personal. Wine yeah. is you know for everybody, it's so personal, and that's what I always try to tell people who are just getting into wine is it's very personal. Don't. You can listen to the advice of other people, but don't feel that you're doing something wrong or drinking something wrong because you're not liking the same thing that somebody else likes. It's, it's just a, it's a personal journey. So tenants have a lot of grip, mm -hmm. but they were absolutely ripe, mm -hmm. and I mean, they will get even smoother yep. in the next years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you think about Cabernet, It's is that real power, but the, the tannin texture is very fine. It's like a really fine velvet, um, where it's just that little prickly yeah. that you get from the edge of the of the um, fabric, but then it has that smoothness yeah. to it as well. And no herbness, nothing. No, no. Yeah. no, that's very unusual to have in Napa Valley. We have fairly consistent vintages. Mm -hmm. um, every now and then we'll have a cool year, um, like 2011 was the last one that comes to mind, but for the most part we get um, quite ripe here, so you don't see the green herbal characters. Most of the time, it's more on that dark cassis blackberry note. Um, you, and we do have like kind of a dry herb, almost an oregano character. It's like a darker dry herb. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's almost to chew mm -hmm. the wine. I mean, it's very dense, mm -hmm. big body. And the, the weather from year to year, is it steadily? I mean, you're talking... It's you relatively know, stable. Yeah. yeah, if you look... I say it's relatively stable. Um, somebody from California would say, oh, it's wildly changing from year to year. Yeah. But, you know, you go to other places in the world and there are far more variable weather patterns in other areas than we have. Okay. Yeah, we have a pretty stable climate here. So there is no climate change by... Uh, oh, I wouldn't say <laughs> that. I didn't say that, but I said we have a consistently yeah. stable climate. Like For the most part, you can generally assume that you are going to be over 23 bricks nine years out of ten. You know, is it like th that's for Cabernet, let's say. Um, whereas other parts of the world, like particularly Burgundy, you know, they have the hailstorms that come through. They can have just ter terribly cool sure. years. They can have super hot years. They, they, the weather's yeah. all over the place. Um, and we don't typically see the swings like that. Now, that being said, there's definitely a climate change pattern because what we're seeing over time, over the last 30 years, say, is an increase um, of our nighttime temperature. So it's mm -hmm. not so much the daytime highs that are uh -huh. going up, because that has gone up a bit, but only like a degree. It's the nighttime Far out, yes, yeah, okay. yeah. It's yeah. Tremendous, yeah. The nighttime lows have gone up five degrees or not uh -huh. five, uh, three degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And that actually is pretty significant because what that affects is the acid degradation in the wine. So the acid is actually degrading faster as you go towards ripeness. So you, you you're not quite having as fresh and crisp of a, I mean I'm exaggerating here because we still obviously are seeing a very fresh Absolutely. grip wine yeah. but over time yeah. if we, this trend continues another 20-30 years um, we might see that starting to impact but that's where we as wine growers have to really um, get in front of it and, and determine how is the best way to combat these changes yeah. in, our, in our climate but, the, but the, I should say the weather is very stable okay. the climate is changing yeah Well, I mean, the, the date of harvest um, continues to be earlier and earlier from year to year. It might, yeah. If it's only by, by one or two days a year, which goes earlier, mm -hmm. but if you take it over two or three decades, yeah. I mean, the trend is unlackable. So, uh, you, 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 I mean, it's obvious, yes. and, and the alcohol content in the champagne area mm -hmm. is, is rising. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you, if anybody has ever worked in agriculture over a period of time, you see it. There is no, there is no discussion about it. It is happening. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I think that people are so far removed from how their food is grown and how their how wines are grown and, and things like that that on a day to day. People don't observe the weather as closely as maybe we used to, yeah. um, and I, I think it it does seem to be something that other people are talking about that's not actually happening. Mm -hmm. 
And Merlot? What about Merlot here in the Napa Valley? I really love Merlot. We actually do have a Napa Valley Merlot. It's much smaller than our Napa Valley Cabernet. And I don't know that it's as widely distributed, so we didn't pour it here. Yeah. But um, to me, Merlot is more like Pinot Noir, but mm -hmm. it's the Pinot Noir of the Bordeaux varieties. You know, it's, it's very fruity and yeah. perfumed and elegant. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest trouble with it is so many people assume it's going to taste like Cabernet and it's going to be big and powerful and rich. And um, it just really is not that type. That's not its personality. Um, so I think it's a little bit misunderstood in that way. Okay. Uh, the length is incredible. Mm -hmm. And the price of, of the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is? 35. 35. And that's US dollars. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. As I talked to uh, Claudia, we, we had the point mm -hmm. that the average price niveau in Napa Valley is um, for German customers um, um, very high, I would say, mm -hmm. honestly, because in the uh, in the retail, I mean, there are two two steps until five euros, until ten euros, mm -hmm. and everything above ten euros is it's hardly right. sold because um, it's not an everyday one. Yeah, and I think that's special for German customers with all. Um, if it comes to vegetables, for example, or meat as well, I mean that's. They do not value uh, higher prices in terms of, of if it comes to quality. Mm -hmm. And there are really interesting statistics. The average price for a grocery in Germany is the lowest all over mm -hmm. Europe. And uh, that says a lot as well, I would say. Cool. So, is there anything we forgot so far? Or do you like to add? Um, well, we do have our reserve Cabernet Sauvignon, oh. which is distributed to Europe, but it is. Um, a much more um, rarer find than you might find with the Napa Cab, okay. we have that to taste if you would like. That's, that's definitely worth to yeah. add it, yeah. <laughs> and we only have about 10 more minutes, so I would hate for you to, uh, yeah, yeah. to miss out on that. And I have a little present for you oh, that I brought from Germany. Uh, <laughs> very hard to find the right one because <laughs> I, I knew you have children for sure mm -hmm. so I brought some German chocolate. Oh fantastic. And the other thing was I was really looking what stands for Germany and uh, but the uh, custom allowance for, for crews into the US uh, yes. is, is very it's restrictive yes. so uh, I took a chance to, to Brought some vegetables too. Oh, to, oh <laughs> to, don't to tell to me that. Yeah. I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's processed food and packed, so oh, okay, uh, good, that, good. that should be fine. All right, that'll be fine. Okay. So this is our 15, 15. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve. And to, to us at the winery, this is really the epitome of what we do here. You know, it's um, Cabernet Sauvignon from Tokelon Vineyard, from Oakville. It is the spirit and the heartbeat of the winery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to us, it's the, the top of what we do. Mm -hmm. This is the wine that we want to always continue to keep getting better and better and better. And want people to come back and think of this wine as that is really one of the iconic great wines of California. And it's like Mr. Mondavi always said, it stands among the great wines of the world as mm -hmm. well. So that's a flagship. Yes, absolutely. I mean, so you can see like, the Napa Valley Cabernet really exemplifies what Napa Valley does as a whole. The Mondavi Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve really exemplifies what Tokelon is as a vineyard. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now the complexity is definitely higher than the uh, Cabernet before. Mm -hmm. It's stronger, more powerful, which means to me it needs more years on the bottle than the wine before. Yeah. And I, I, I would say again, it's it's too young to drink yes, well, for, for my palate. Absolutely. But and you know, and it's, I think you see those tannins soften over time, and you see more of the tertiary aromas like the dried dates and figs and tobacco leaf and. You know, things of those, that nature that really bring additional complexity and undertones to the wine do develop over time. So my 
personal favorite, and remember, I'm a mid-age drinker, you know, for, yeah. for wines. My personal favorite time to drink these is between 15 and 20 years old. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a long time, right? Yeah. My husband likes them 30 years old-ish, so. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that could go another way. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. So you can see the the intensity just yeah. is incredible. Lots of length, long licorice seas, blackberry, this velvety tan. Lakritz. What is Lakritz in English? It, um, I need to look it up. That's the, the black candy stuff. Licorice. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, licorice, that's, yeah. that's it, yeah. Yeah, you definitely okay. see that. You see that dark green, dry herb. You know, there's just a, a lot happening with this. That would fit perfect to a steak or something. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. What makes me hungry again? Mm -hmm. And at the end, you see that warm warmth from the baking spice characteristics. The oak, the light. Toast, a little bit of smoky hint. There's just so much happening in this. Yeah, moment. the wine changes and continues to change mm -hmm. on the palate, and uh, that's what we call complexity mm -hmm. and um, what makes wine interested. And that is a, a factor for quality, as I explained Absolutely. in the episode before. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and to me, the, the two key elements of really great wine are intensity and co concentration. And then complexity. So the intensity and concentration, like how how much flavor is there? Is it just a lot? Is that flavor very specific? Mm. So like you and I have been batting around over ten descriptors for this wine at this for point, sure. and that's where you really. If see. I'm not jet lagging, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's where you really see yeah. the the complexity coming yeah. in here. Is there's so much happening in that glass? All right. So thank you. Once more, yes, for thank your you precious for coming time. to see us. Thank this you very fantastic. much. And uh, see you soon, Noah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So, und dann war es das auch schon wieder. Ich bin mal wieder sehr überrascht, wie schnell dann doch über eine Stunde wieder schnell vorübergeht, wenn man einfach im Flow ist, sich über sein Lieblingsthema mit äußerst kompetenten Personen unterhält und natürlich dann auch noch die leckeren Weine, insbesondere den letzten im Glas hat. Alle Weine, die wir besprochen haben, gibt es auch in Deutschland. Da waren die freundlicherweise so und haben und die Weinauswahl so gestaltet, dass ihr auch die Weine kaufen könnt. Wie gesagt, Preisniveau, die ersten vier sind unter 30 Euro in Deutschland zu haben und der letzte ist dann doch ein bisschen teuer äh, mit 180 Euro natürlich schon exorbitant im Preis, aber eben auch in der Qualität. Ja, ich hätte gern noch sogar ein bisschen mehr Zeit gehabt, mich mit dem letzten Wein intensiver auseinanderzusetzen, aber ganz ehrlich, wir sind mir sind dann einfach am Schluss die Körner ausgegangen. Es war ja dann schon halb sechs Ortszeit und äh, wir sind ja neun Stunden in Kalifornien hinterher gewesen. Da war ich dann einfach auch froh, dass ich den Tag beenden konnte und in mein Hotelzimmer zu fahren und dann erstmal die Sachen alle zu verdauen und nochmal äh, sacken zu lassen. Wir, mir ist im Nachgang noch aufgefallen, dass ich einmal äh, eine falsche Abkürzung verwendet habe, das, ich hatte KMV gesagt, ähm, richtigerweise heißt es aber KMW für Kloster Neuburger Mostwaage. Das ist eine Einheit für den Zuckergehalt im Most. In Kalifornien, wie Nova erklärt hat, verwendet man Bricks. Und wir in Deutschland nehmen dafür halt Öxle. Das ist im Prinzip ein und dasselbe, aber ich habe es euch auch nochmal als äh, Hintergrundinfo Link in den Show Notes gepackt. Da werdet ihr dann auch nochmal zu den Rebsorten und zum Master of Wine Institute nochmal was finden. Ja, ich fand beide oder alle drei Locations oder Interviewpartner hervorragend. Ähm, das ist jetzt auch zunächst mal aus der kalifornischen Ecke 
das Letzte. Wir bewegen uns dann mit den Interviews wieder zurück nach Deutschland und ich bin schon gespannt, wer da mein nächster Interviewpartner sein wird. Lasst mich wie immer wissen, wie er das Interview fandet, ob er mit dem Englischen zurechtkam, wie er die Soundqualität fandet. Es war nämlich so, ich musste ein bisschen Nachbearbeitung machen, weil im Hintergrund die äh, Fasslager mit Raumbefeuchter besprüht worden sind. Das hat man zunächst ziemlich stark in der Aufnahme gehört, aber ich denke, das äh, hat dann soweit ganz gut gepasst. Lasst mich wissen, wie die Weine waren, wenn ihr euch für einen oder für mehrere davon entschieden habt. Ich würde mich freuen, euch bald wieder hier begrüßen zu dürfen. Ich wünsche euch jetzt eine gute Zeit, leckere Weine und verbleibt wie immer mit genussreichen Grüßen aus München. Euer Florian. Ciao, Servus, bis zum nächsten Mal.